What's up, everybody? Dorn Aldana here coming at you with another kick-ass episode of the Art of Mortgage Marketing podcast. Today, we're going to talk about how to make the shift from call reluctance to call confidence. From call reluctance to call confidence. How do you make that shift? How do you go from feeling like you've got imposter syndrome, weak in the knees, wobbly, lacking confidence, lacking mojo, feeling like the phone is 8,000 pounds, not wanting to make those calls, feeling like it's a have to versus a get to, and feeling like you don't have much to bring to the table in terms of value such that you feel like you're in an annoying pest versus a welcome guest. And the last thing you want to do is feel rejected, right? To have them basically hand it to you and not give you the time of day. And next thing you know, it's like, why am I doing this? This is painful. And so we tend to resist that which we deem and presume and assume will be painful. So how can we make that shift from feeling like it's a have to to something that it's a get to where we feel confidence, certainty, mojo, swagger factor, And we feel connected to purpose where we know that we have something of value to bring and unique value, compelling value, meaningful value, such that it's something we're compelled into action with, something we want to do, we're on mission for. How do we make that shift? Like it's one thing to say it. It's a whole other thing to live it, right? To have that knowing in our hearts that it's something we're living on purpose with purpose. So I want to talk to you a bit about that today as it relates to how to really be on purpose and be persistent and consistent with your proactive prospecting. Because let's be real, this is an exceedingly tough market right now, right? Rates continue to go up. We see partners that used to be doing... 20 plus buyer sides a year, now doing five, six, seven, right? A lot of realtors leaving the business, a lot of loan officers, mortgage pros leaving the business, leaving in droves, not a little trickle, but dropping like flies over the last almost two years now. So it's a tough market. Let's just be real. Let's face it and face the eye of the tiger that this is an absolute market purge. And you don't want to be one of those who are being purged. So how are we going to get you in the position where you're taking market share? Because there's still transactions to be had, right? Regardless of rates, inventory, margin, compression, and inflation and hyper competition, people continue to get into the market. They move up in the market. They get married. They get divorced and they die. All those things are still happening. And all those things, those events come with transactions. So they might as well have your name on them, right? There's still transactions to be had, friends. It's not like there's no transactions. The question is, how are you going to take market share? And if you're drifting versus driving, that's a great way to regress, stagnate. And stagnation tends to breed rot. And it tends to lead to a precipice of nine to five prison, or I can't afford a prison. Either way, it's a prison. We want to avoid being a slave to the market. We want to use the market and whatever storm you may be facing so that you show up on top. You take market share. You dominate your market. You become stronger, better, sharper, wiser as a result of this storm. Because if there's no pressure, there's no diamonds. So may the diamond inside of you be unleashed because of the pressure that is inborn by virtue of this being a tough market right now. It's a default setting, guys. This storm is galing against everybody. The question is, are you going to use this to propel you higher, to make you better, or to make you bitter? Are you going to use this to propel you towards Paradise Island, regardless of market conditions? Or are you going to use this to get bitter and feel like a victim to the market, complain, whine, snivel, and play the victim role and get smashed against the rocks? You choose because the storm is dealing against everybody. The question is, are you going to use it for your betterment or are you going to get used by it? 
and how you position yourself will determine whether or not it's an advantage to you or a disadvantage, whether it is an opportunity or an adversity. Yes, the challenge is there. The question is, are you using that challenge to unleash the diamond within? Are you using that pressure to forge the diamond within you. I submit to you the opportunity here is to forge the diamond within you. And there's only one way to do that, to use this pressure to propel you into more persistent and consistent proactive prospecting. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Let's talk about what it's gonna take to shift from call reluctance to call confidence. First thing I wanna talk about is the suck of call reluctance, dreading making calls, feeling like you're an imposter and you don't have a unique value proposition. You're just going to be a pest, an annoyance to someone, interrupting something that's more important to them. And you just feel squeamish and like, why am I doing this? What value do I bring? And then what happens is either A, you make calls and you're not getting results because you're reflecting on the outside what you already feel in the inside. If you feel like you don't have a compelling reason to be on the phone with them and a compelling reason for them to work with you, they're going to feel that too. There's certainty transference. There's also lack of certainty transference where you have wobble in your knees. Lack of certainty means doubt, fear, inadequacy, imposter syndrome. And all that is reflected. If you feel it on the inside, you're going to project it on the outside. And then what happens is they feel your lack of certainty. And if you're not certain, they're not going to be certain. If they feel fear, the last thing you're going to want to do is invite your fear in. They already have enough fear. They don't need yours, right? So the suck of call reluctance is that we become imprisoned by this fear, this doubt, this imposter syndrome, and it becomes heavy. It's a heavy weight on our shoulders. And we don't take powerful action. Our light is dimmed. We don't have the swagger factor, the mojo, the confidence we want because our battery is being drained, drained by fear. So, the light in us is snuffed out. It's dimmed. It's diminished. And now we're going into a dark world. Instead of being a bright, beautiful light and a beacon of light for those who need your leadership and need your caring and need your beautiful, bright light to cast out the darkness, they have your darkness, your fear, your doubt. They already have enough darkness. They don't need yours. So it becomes this downward cycle of suck where you feel lack of motivation, lack of confidence, and an object that is immobilized tends to stay immobilized until acted upon by an outside force. Likewise, a object in motion tends to stay in motion until acted upon by an outside force. You can see that these laws of physics apply in the spiritual, on the soul level as well, that any momentum without starts with momentum within and any lack of momentum without starts with lack of momentum within. That's where you have the brakes on. There's only two ways to accelerate your success, friends. Only two ways, throttle up or release the brakes. Either way, both will support you in accelerating your success. And I submit to you that most people, they need to release the brakes as the first step, because otherwise you're just grinding on the brakes while you're throttling up. That's not going to serve you. That's called a lot of friction, a lot of heat, unnecessary, a lot of stress, unnecessary. So before you throttle up more, why not release the brakes of fear? The release on the inside where you're getting in your own way, your, your own bottleneck. Let's release that. So that's the suck of call reluctance. So let's talk now about what's at the root of call reluctance. At the end of the day, there are three big roots to call reluctance I want to bring to your attention. The first one is what I call stinking thinking, mind trash. You want to win in your business regardless of market conditions, you got to take out the trash. 
your mind trash. And stinking thinking is really just about being focused on self. Any thoughts, paradigms, beliefs that get you focused on self instead of serving others and feeling like you're inadequate is going to be in the genre called stinking thinking. It's going to get you feeling a funky feeling of fear, doubt, lack, limitation. It's going to have you contract like the turtle inside of its turtle shell. And all of that's going to have you not bringing the best version of yourself, but having that contracted version of yourself that's limited in power, limited in your light, limited in your service. And that will never suffice. If you want to get off the runway into the jet stream and into your dream, making freedom money, you've got to go full throttle, which means you need to release the brakes of the stinking thinking. So some common stinking thinking type of mind trash items that I've experienced and that many of my clients have experienced are things like, I don't have anything of unique value to bring to the table. I'm just annoying people. I don't want to annoy people. I don't want to be a pest. I'm a loser. I don't follow through on my word. I don't feel comfortable being uncomfortable. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I'm not in the mood. Uh, It's too difficult out there. The market is too hard. It's not worth trying. It's brutal out there. There's not much I can do to overcome that. I might as well just hunker down. All of those stories have you be in a lack limitation victim story that steals your power. It steals your ability to take proactive action in a powerful way, right? And so what do we do? We drag our heels, we stick our tail between our legs, and we are defeated before we even get started by the stinking thinking in our own head, the mind trash in our own head. So that's one root of call reluctance. The second root is just having a weak lackluster value proposition. So that's where... We think about what we bring to the table. We feel like it's not extraordinary. It's just kind of ordinary. And we just feel like, "Eh, why would anyone want to dance with me? I'm ugly. I'm not good looking. I don't know how to dance. I have dirty clothes, a dirty shirt, dirty pants. Like, why would someone want to work or, you know, dance with me, so to speak, using the dancing metaphor? And if we feel that sense of inadequacy in our identity, as well as in our value proposition, again, it's reflected. Our business is like a mirror. How we see ourselves is reflected in how other people see us. If we see ourselves as a beautiful, bright light that's divinely animated to make a difference in the world, and that we're simply a vessel, an instrument, to bring light and leadership and love into a dark world, to make a difference in other people's lives. If we feel that way and see ourselves that way, then our life, our business will reflect that. But if we see ourselves as a mistake, as an accident, something went wrong in the manufacturing process. If we feel like God messed up and there's insufficiencies and inadequacies and how the end product was produced in the manufacturing process malfunctioned and we feel like there's something missing in what we bring and who we are. Well, then again, people are going to respond energetically to what you already feel about yourself. Your business, your life is a reflection of how you see yourself. And so you don't need necessarily to have some fancy dancy gizmo gadget, some fancy uh, value stack in order to have confidence on the phone. You just need to have confidence in the uniqueness you bring. And so there's two components to a value proposition. It's the value stack you bring to your partners or lack thereof. It's also the value stack in who you see yourself to be how you see yourself, your own self inventory. And if that inventory is lackluster, they're going to see it because you see it. They're going to feel it because you feel it. And the third root of call reluctance is chasing versus attracting. This is where 
we come with our cups empty because we feel lack, limitation, scarcity, inadequacy, imposter syndrome before we even pick up the phone. And then when we come to the calls with realtors, we have our cup empty, not full, such that we feel attached to a yes, because anything less than that feels like rejection. And because we're already prone to rejecting ourselves, we're hyper prone to feeling rejected by others because we first rejected ourselves and any rejection or any behavior that seems like rejection from the outside confirms and affirms the rejection we already see and already hold to ourselves. Do you see that? It's a reflection. If you've already rejected yourself, then naturally you're going to be hypersensitive to other people rejecting you. But if you embrace yourself, if you love yourself, and if you know that God didn't make any junk, he didn't start with you, and you're divinely appointed and anointed for such a time as this to bring light in the darkness, you're just simply a, a vessel. You're not perfect, but you know the one who animates you, spirit, God, source is perfect, and God is working in you and through you to make a difference in the world. You're just simply surrendered to that spirit to bring light, love, and leadership into this dark world, then all of a sudden that knowing upwells in your soul and it brings confidence, not arrogance, but confidence. Arrogance is thinking, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But not knowing why you're good. Confidence is saying, I know I'm good. And I know why I'm good. Not because I'm good, but because he who works in me and through me is good, is glorious. And so there's that sense of alignment where you know that you know that you know that God didn't make any junk. He didn't start with you, right? And it's that alignment that allows you to own in your power. But the disalignment has you showing up empty handed and has you showing up with an empty cup. And what happens is when you show up with an empty cup, you're hungry and thirsty for affirmation. And when you don't get it, you shift into fear and you contract and you feel inadequate because it's confirming the fear you already had before you picked up the phone, that you're not enough, that you're inadequate. I can tell you how many times I struggled with this as a young man feeling inadequate. I was so riddled with this that in high school, they called me bathroom boy because I spent all my time in the bathroom pretending to use the facilities, but really I was trying to get my hair just right twiddling my hair, just trying to get it just right. Because I felt that if I could just get my hair just right, then I would be enough. Then people would like me. Then I'd be popular. Then I'd be loved. Then I'd be a somebody. Then I'd be significant. See, I was yearning for significance because I didn't have a belief that I was significant. I was yearning to be popular because I didn't feel like I was enough in my own mind and heart. I was yearning for acceptance because I didn't accept myself. And so I was doing all this outward manipulation with my hair because inside, in my heart, I was hollow. There was an empty part of my soul that was trying to be filled by having acceptance on the outside because I didn't know how to give myself acceptance on the inside. And what happens when you do that is you start chasing things. When you bring that to calls, you start to chase because you're attached to the outcome. You're attached to them saying yes. You're attached to them agreeing with you. You're attached to them being the right fit. You're attached to getting the appointment. You're attached to them wanting to do business with you because anything less than them giving you an agreeable result agrees with what you already have in your soul and your spirit, feeling inadequate. And that's what breeds rejection. So, Chasing is just a, a symptom of attachment, attachment to an outcome because you're in fear and attachment is a coping mechanism of fear. So now that we've unpacked some of the nuances and finer distinctions of what's at the root of call reluctance, let's talk now about what's at the root of call confidence. Let's start with the first root, and that is a healthy self-image. Now, this is a fine line, right? Because you can shift into arrogance pretty easily here if you prop yourself up in an unhealthy way. This is not about saying, I'm great, I'm the best, you know, I'm better than all the rest, 
I'm amazing. I'm perfect. I'm phenomenal. I'm beautiful. I'm a somebody like, you know, sure. Some of those statements and affirmations may be of value to you and helpful to you. But if you're saying all that stuff and you're doing things that are not in alignment with that, your subconscious mind's going to be like, who are you trying to fool? I'm not stupid. Like you're not congruent. You're not authentic and aligned with truth. So it's important to have a healthy self-image that's in alignment with truth. And in my experience, the only way to do that is to accept a higher power perspective where it's like realizing, hey, I'm not perfect, but I know God is. I know I'm not enough, but I know God is more than enough. I know that I'm limited, but I know God is unlimited. I know that I've got all a matter of weakness, but I know God has sufficient strength. So it's that healthy self-image where you know who you are and whose you are, where you can surrender to that higher power and come into a place where you're living on purpose, with purpose, on mission, and you're animated with a spirit that is unlimited, even though you're limited. You're animated with a spirit that has ultimate, infinite wisdom, even though you're lacking wisdom. And you can now surrender and say, God, I don't have it all figured out, but I know you do. I surrender to you. And it's through that empowerment that comes through the power of faith that allows you now to be shifted out of self-centered, self-focused paradigm into other person focused paradigm where you can focus on others, serve others, make a difference for others, be a leader for others, be light and love for others. And you start to get over yourself. You start to let go of your fears and let go of your self judgments. You let go of the attachments to outcomes and you allow yourself to be malleable in your maker's hands. Next thing you know, you're in a place where you can really show up and shine, not because you're any better per se. You still have the same raw material you had before, but you allow yourself to show up better because you're surrendered and you're in faith versus fear. And you're in a place where you can really allow the best version of yourself to show up. And you start to see yourself in the space of grace and you allow yourself to be imperfect because you know the perfect one covers you in grace. And it allows you to be in this beautiful place of faith versus fear because you're letting go of judgment of self. You're letting go of attachment to outcomes and you're enjoying the process. You see, it's through surrender, not striving or stressing, but it's through surrender that we gain strength and serenity. And it's through that serenity and that strength where your light can shine bright in the darkness. And all of a sudden now you're showing up in a way that's attractive. Like the late and great, the late and great Jim Rohn once said, he said it so well, such a beautiful truth that still resonates to this day for me. And that is you can't chase success. It's like an elusive butterfly. It will forever elude you. You attract success by becoming an attractive person by who you become by becoming an attractive person. So the principle here is start to embrace a healthy self image where you give yourself grace, knowing that you're not perfect, but God who made you and knit you in your mother's womb is perfect. And it allows you to, position yourself in a place where you can have a posture of peace and poise because there's no shame. There's no guilt. There's no fear. There's no doubt because it's not about you. It's about who you are and whose you are. And when you know that God didn't make any junk and he didn't start with you, you can start to take risks and you can start to take risks knowing that Nothing you can do or not do will ever shake your security, your value, your worth. 
I can't tell you how long I was riddled with fear and imposter syndrome because I felt like my value and my worth was inextricably linked to my performance. I was afraid of losing the success I had. I was afraid of being exposed that I was not enough, that I was an imposter, that even the success I had was a fluke or was luck. And so I was constantly running from the bear and had an unhealthy relationship with myself, had an unhealthy relationship with work because I used work as a crutch. I was a workaholic, constantly working because I was always running from the bear because I felt inadequate no matter how high I climbed. So self-image is at the center of all that. When we feel secure and safe in self, we can surrender. And that's when the best version of ourselves shows up. And it's in the best version of ourselves showing up that we can create our best life, our blessed life, the abundant life. But only through that surrender, only through that trust, only through faith, not through fear. So that's one root of call confidence is shifting your self image so that you can lose yourself to find yourself and come to a place where you let go of yourself so you can serve others. The second part of call confidence, the second route is a killer unique offer. So that's where it's like, it doesn't matter how many mantras you tell yourself. If you don't have something meaningful, tangible to bring to the table to these realtors, you're going to have wobbly knees at some point because it's all just talk. Eventually you got to walk the talk. Eventually you got to be able to deliver on some promises And that's where having a kick-ass unique value proposition comes in where you feel confident in yourself. You have confidence in who you are, whose you are, what you represent, the value you bring. And you have confidence that even if you don't necessarily know all the details on fulfillment, that no one's going to grind from a standpoint of putting in the effort, the work, the discipline, the devotion, the commitment. No one's going to grind for your partners more than you will. I have a great coach on my faculty called Coach Pete, and he has an awesome strategy where he brings grinders to his realtors, custom branded with his logo on it. It says, no one's going to grind for you more than I will. What a great way to set yourself up, to position yourself in the identity of service, right? And the value proposition can be a multitude of different things. It could be helping them get more repeat and referral business and rave reviews. It could be getting more leads at their open houses, converting more of those leads into buyers and closed deals. It could be automating that process. It could be getting more rave reviews on Google and turning those rave reviews into red hot referrals. It could be mining the gold from the database. It could be resurrecting dead leads into hot for what you got leads. It could be taking expireds and winning new listings for sale by owners and getting more buyers and sellers to dish to your partners. There's so many different strategies. The main thing is you need to feel a certain degree of confidence in your ability to bring unique value no one else is delivering. That's one of the reasons why I recommend from all my clients doing what I call the 50 stack. The 50 reasons why smart, ambitious, growth-minded realtors would deem it a privilege to work with you. Notice every one of those references is like a leg underneath a table, your belief table. And the more legs under the table, what happens to the stability and strength of the table? It gets more stable, more strong. True? Imagine 50 legs under that table. Notice how strong, how fortified, how stable, how unstoppable that table is. That's why you want to do the 50 stack. 50 reasons why smart, ambitious, growth-minded realtors would deem it a privilege to work with you. And then the third route of call confidence is sifting and sorting versus selling. You see, if you're selling, if you're leaning towards the girl to kiss her while she leans away, that's a great way, a great setup for rejection. Have you noticed? If you're leaning towards them and they're leaning away, that's a great way to set yourself up for disempowerment. 
On the flip side, if you know there's an ocean of abundance, an ocean of opportunity, and all you need is seven to 10 rock star top producing realtors sending you one, two, three deals a month to be making freedom money, and you know there's thousands of realtors in your license area, and all you need is seven to 10 rock stars sending you a deal or more a month to be making freedom money. There's a certain degree of abundance mindedness there that allows you to relax, let go of attachments of outcomes. And instead of trying to chase anyone with a pulse who can fog a mirror who calls himself a realtor, you are only working with the cool cats that you have the right synergy, the right chemistry and the right alignment to work with. You only work with those who you have the right fit to work with battery chargers versus battery drainers. So now instead of feeling like you have to convert everybody, you're simply sifting and sorting. It's like a basket of apples. You sift and sort. You're not attached to outcomes. You're sifting out the rotten apples. You don't poke them. You don't sniff them. You don't you know, inspect them. You leave rotten apples alone. You don't mess with those. Those are the ones who tell you to F off, stop, get lost, get out of here, screw you. Like you just leave those rotten apples alone. You don't mess with them. Then you have the green apples that are a little bit tepid. They're shy. They're maybe a little jaded because they're getting pounded by all these loan officers that are showing up as loan leeches and mortgage parasites and they're wasting their time. And of course they got a buyer defense mechanism now because they're sick and tired of having their time and their energy wasted by our, all these loan leeches that don't deliver and are just wanting to take instead of give. So of course they're going to be jaded. Of course they're going to have that buyer defense mechanism. So for those ones, they need to hear your heart. They need to hear your certainty. They need to, feel your lack of attachment to the outcome. They need to have your overture in a way where they feel almost a fear of missing out because how you show up and shine is so aligned with the divine that it's like, why would I say no to this? I love your energy. I love that you're not attached to the outcome. I love that you're coming to bring business versus take business. I love the relaxed confidence you exude. So subconsciously, they're going to feel like, why would I say no to this? I'd be crazy not to at least take that first step to explore possible synergy. So that's how you want to position yourself. That's the power of sifting and sorting versus selling. And then, of course, you want the red apples. Those are the ones who are eager and open to have a, having a conversation. They're the ones that are receptive. They're the ones that are a yes right? A yes to a meeting, a yes to a partnership, right? They may not start off being a red apple. They might be a green apple and you need to ripen them up a little bit, but it's because of your certainty, your confidence, your connection to purpose, your lack of attachment, your lack of judgment, the fact that you're surrendered in the process, you're cool either way, you're cool as a cucumber either way. It's that energetic foundation that you come from and source your overture from that allows them, to, allows them to ripen from a green apple to a red apple. So you're sifting and sorting and you're not attached to outcomes. It's SW, SW, SW. Some will, some won't. So what next? Someone's waiting. And that allows you to never have to worry about rejection because if anything, they're just rejecting the opportunity. They're not rejecting you and they're giving you a gift. It's called, thank you for saving me time. Because clearly you're not ready for my gift yet. You don't qualify for my gift yet. You don't tell them that, but that's what you're saying in your head. So you're grateful when you sift someone out, when you sort someone out, when they don't qualify because some will, some won't. So what next? Someone's waiting. You're just looking for those red apples. And again, you don't need many of them. We're going narrow, deep, and rich with a few, seven to 10, who send you one, two, three deals a month versus going shallow, skimpy, and wide with many. And those guys are getting chewed up and spat out. The mediocre realtors, the middle of the road realtors, those are the ones who are first and most affected by market downturns versus least and last. You don't want to be working with those. You want to work with the top dogs who own the lion's share of the inventory, who are doing the most amount of buyer side, listing side, seller side deals and who have capacity to send you the most amount of business. The question is, how do you attract those people? 
Well, if you've been listening to this, you may be like, Dorn, I'm picking up what you're laying down. This is exactly what I need. I just need more structure. I need to know what is my value proposition. I need to know how can I attract versus chase. I need some structure and perhaps some coaching and some campaigns as to how do I make that initial overture? What are the words that work that get these realtors half of what I've got? What's the method? What do I send by text? What do I send by email? What are the things that I need to say and not say to avoid repelling the right people and to increase the odds of attracting the right people? How can I overcome the common objections and smoke screens and objections that stop me from booking appointments because I'm like a deer in the headlights? I don't know how to overcome that objection. Like I already have a lender. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm not interested. Call me later. Then they ghost me. Like, how do I overcome that? If that's you and you're in it to win it and you're defiantly committed to adding at least an extra hundred thousand dollars plus to your annual income and to winning in any market and instead of just a fair weather market and you want to consistently grow your pipeline regardless of rates, inventory, inflation, hyper competition, margin compression. If that's you and you're a hundred percent commission mortgage pro and you're making 70 basis points or higher, and you wanna add at least $100,000 or more to your annual income in the next 12 months or less, I invite you to take advantage of a complimentary breakthrough call where you get on the phone with me or one of my consultants, we lift up the HUD in your business, we look at what's working, what's not working, where you're at now, where you wanna be, and if we can help you create a breakthrough in your business, we'll show you what that looks like inside of our proven system. If not, we'll be the first to advise you to pass. But either way, you leave that call with massive value, massive clarity. Chances are we're going to have some fun. At least that's our intention for the call. So if that seems worthwhile and meaningful to you, go ahead and book a call now at mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Again, that's mortgagemarketingcoach.com forward slash apply. Well, that's all we got for today, friends. Thanks for hanging with me. I trust you got some value, some insight. Perhaps you got reminded of some things you already knew and maybe picked up some new distinctions that you didn't know or that you needed more clarity and more distinction on. And if indeed you got them from today's session, certainly a worthwhile session. I'm sure you'd agree. If you didn't get it, maybe listen to it a second time. And something tells me you'll get something new you didn't get on the first lap. As someone very wise once said, true discovery is not seeing new landscapes, but seeing old landscapes with new eyes. So repetition is the mother of all learning, father of all skill, and the birthplace of all mastery. So pursue mastery. Listen to these over and over, and you're going to pick up new distinctions. If you dig what I'm laying down here on this podcast, I'd love for you to share your feedback by giving us a review on Spotify, on Apple, so that we can get more and more credibility for this podcast. So more and more people can be touched, more and more lives can be changed because of what we do here on Planet Prosper at MortgageMarketingCoach.com. So if you deem us worthy of a five-star review, thank you in advance for doing so. My name is Doran Aldana coming at you from the Mortgage Marketing uh, Podcast, the Art of Mortgage Marketing Podcast, and we will see you on the next episode. Peace, y'all. Thanks for being with us.